Now, there is an important section under 41D, which deals with the removal and suspension of the trustees. Now, this section is also responsible for creating humongous amount of litigation in the charity commission. So what happens in section 41D is, basically that's a power given to the charity commissioner for removing a trustee or suspending a trustee if, if he himself comes to know or his attention is brought to by way of an application of a trustee or a person interested or once the report is made under section 41D of the inquiry as I mentioned. The assistant charity commissioner and the deputy charity commissioner will conduct inquiry and institute inquiry under 41B and therefore thereafter file a report. And upon reading such report, if charity commissioner is satisfied that there is a default in submission of the accounts, persistent default, not only default, persistent default. There is a disobeying of the orders of the charity commissioner. There is a negligence in duty and the trustees are committing the acts of malfeasance and misfeasance or breach of trust. He is trying to misappropriate the property and is dealing with the properties improperly or in a manner which is not known to the law. He is accepting the position in such a manner which is prejudicial to the interest of the trust <coughs> or his position as a trustee or he is convicted of an offence involving moral, moral turpitude. Then in such situation the charity commissioner is empowered to remove or suspend a trustee and but before passing an order of such nature he will have to frame charge. Upon framing a charge the trustee who is going to be the subject matter of this removal and suspension will be given chance to lead evidence. He will also have the authority to test the evidence which is against him which includes cross examination and everything and thereafter on every count of charge the charity commissioner will have to give a finding and pass an appropriate order by exercising the powers of suspension or removal of trustees. The power mentioned in 41D is absolutely of judicial nature. Therefore, there has to be a reasoned order. Arguments will have to be dealt with properly and finding has to be recorded for on every aspect of the termination or suspension or removal. The power under 41D also includes the power of appointing a trustee in case, in case after, appoint, uh, after suspending or removing a trustee, <clears throat> trust comes to a position where the available number of trustees can function that function or can't uh, uh, with the available number of trustees, the trust can't function because of the, specu uh, the, the uh, peculiar clause in the instrument of trust regarding the number of trustees or the person or the trustee who is being removed or suspended is the sole trust. Then in such situation and only in these situations, the 41D order will also follow or will also come up with an order of appointment of a new, new trust. <clears throat> the appeal under this order under 41D lies to the court that is the high court. This is all the uh, uh, powers vested with the charity commissioner. When the charity commissioner has realized that there is already a damage to the property or 41D particularly is the power when the charity, uh, when the trustees has already committed the wrong, that is by transferring the property or alienating the property, which is not in accordance with the law, by committing the breach of trust, by committing the act of malfeasance, misfeasance and by committing the, uh, uh, not committing, but uh, in, uh, improperly dealing with the property. These are the, the powers under 41D can be exercised when the act is done. But what if the charity commissioner once or if notified about the possible happening of the event can arrest such happening of the event completely to ensure that such eventuality is also covered by instituting or by investing appropriate powers to the charity commissioner section 41 E was introduced. Now what does section 41 E does? Section 41 E really speaking is the power vested with the charity commissioner to issue temporary injunction or the orders ancillary to that. Now when such temporary injunction can be uh, issued as the name suggests that temporary injunction first of all the application can be filed by two persons having interest supported by an affidavit. 
so the patch in the application will have to be supported supported by an affidavit secondly on the basis of the report filed by the assistant or deputy charity manager now these reports as you must have understood can be filed in the previous sections of 37 38 or for that matter under 41 b also and once that report is filed the charity commissioner if the charity commissioner is satisfied of the fact that the trust property is in danger being wasted damaged improperly alienated or being dealt with improperly or the trust trustee or such persons connected with the trust are threatening or intending to remove or dispose of the property of the trust then in such case the as a charity commissioner can issue an order of temporary injunction as also in order to arrest the uh, possible damage or alienation it or to stay such eventuality from occurring it can order the production of the property before the court it can ask the accused or rather the respondents or the wrongdoer trustees to give accounts or also give security and pass appropriate orders to ensure that the trust property is safe now if the charity commissioner is made aware of the fact that the notice to the respondents or notice to the wrongdoer is going to further delay and rather rendering the action under 41 e fruitless then in such situation charity commissioner is also empowered to act ex parte and issue appropriate orders ex parte so that's a very important power that is given to the charity commissioner to ensure that the trust property is properly protected now before granting the final order of temporary injunction or as uh, appropriate order as may be necessary in the facts and uh, facts and circumstances of the case the charity commissioner has to hear the parties and if necessary initiate appropriate enquiries in accordance with the rules so that is also one of the burden that is with that uh, that lies with the charity commissioner to ensure that before granting any injunction of course finally finally but temporary injunction it has to ensure that proper investigation proper inquiry has been done and only thereafter such order can be passed now what the charity commissioner can do at the final stage after having granted let's say ex parte injunction order then at the final stage what it can do is either discharge that injunction that is ad interim in nature or modify that injunction or pass any other op, uh, order appropriate order so as to protect the property of the trust so it can really speaking keep the trustees under obligation to keep filing the accounts with the trust uh, with the charity commissioner or it can also direct the trustees to produce as many documents as may be required for the purpose of protecting the property so it is not only limited to the temporary injunction but it goes beyond to achieve the object of issuing the temporary injunction the 41e is also of such nature which is really speaking very wide in in terms of the powers vested with the charity commissioner the more important the important aspect is that when you go with the charity uh, with this application of such nature before the charity commissioner actually pleadings which are necessary for obtaining temporary injunction are necessary to be pleaded such as balance of convenience prima facie case and irreversible injury naturally this aspect of temporary injunction will be covered by section 30 of the specific relief act and <clears throat> more importantly order that is passed by the assistant uh, the charity commissioner under 41e is appealable directly to the high court so <clears throat> these are the property these are these, these are the powers under 41e now by way of introduction of the new section that is 41 the powers are now vested with the charity commissioner to attach the properties of one who flouts the order or shows at most disrespect to the orders passed by the charity commissioner under chapter 6 chapter 6 basically deals with this control so 41f is basically introduced by the legislature by way of uh, amendment act of 2017 to ensure that the orders of the charity commissioners are properly followed and this uh, regardless of the fact that the contempt of court act is very much applicable to the proceedings before the charity commissioner to ensure that the orders can be executed by some manner they have introduced this particular section whereby the proper of the properties or the persons connected to the trust can be attached and can be sold also for the purpose of satisfaction of the orders of the court that's a very unique and other very powerful provision that's been brought into effect and 
what the court can do or what the charity commissioner can do with 41f is if the orders passed under section under chapter 6 there is a chapters relating to control over the properties of the trust are not followed or the orders under 41e let's say 41d 41b 41a are not followed by the trustees then the charity commissioner can attach the properties of the wrongdoer or the persons who are disobeying the order of the court and they can attach it for a period of one, maximum one year and even after a period of even after the expiry of one year if the disobedience or other the flouting continues then they can sell the property in accordance with the procedure laid down that is public auction and the sale proceeds of such transaction will be utilized for the purposes of satisfying the liability and remaining whatever is the remaining or other they can also be importantly they can also be utilized for the purposes of awarding compensation to the trust or the persons who are in that sense agree and the remaining if at all there is anything remaining then the remaining can be given to the persons entitled so that's also a very new section that's been introduced by your 40 or 2018 amendment now these are more or less the powers of the charity commissioner under the sections uh, under chapter 6 of the act now that takes us to section 47 of the public trust act now this is the power of the charity commissioner of appointment remove removal suspension discharge of the trustee but this appointment removal suspension discharge is little different in the sense that under section 47 the removal can happen when the trustee himself is not willing to execute the trust or he wants to discharge from the post or he wants to resign from the post then he is absent from india without the permission of the charity commissioner for a period of more than 6 months he has left this country for good to reside in some other country then in such situation charity commissioner on an application can exercise his power remove that particular trustee and in his place that's, that's a very general power that that can be utilized by the uh, charity commissioner for appointment of the trust and to ensure that number of trustees are maintained for the purposes of or administration of the trust that takes us to the appointment of the trustee as to how the appointment takes place now appointment as i mentioned is defined under section or procedure is laid down in section 47 now at the time of appointment first of all due regard should be given wishes of the person who is likely to be appointed wishes of the beneficiary is also importantly the wishes of the persons who are appointed to the trustee also will have to be taken into account and more and above all the trust or uh, the, the charity commissioner at the time of appointing a new trustee also should understand the custom and the usage of the usage that is being followed by the beneficiaries or rather the person interested at the time of appointment of a new trustee so having given due regard to all these parameters go ahead and appoint a new trustee now it's as i mentioned it's a very general power that's vested with the charity commissioner now the section 50 really speaking assumes a lot of importance and i'll tell you why section 50 basically empowers the charity commissioner to file a suit and the charity commissioner also if the charity commissioner is satisfied of the fact that there is negligence committed by the trustees then there is any misconduct by the trustees and there is any need to recover possession of the property or there is any need to seek account of such property or proceeds from either a trustee ex trustee or any other person but naturally the class of the people who have the adverse possession of the property of the trust trespassers or licensee or tenant are excluded and this exclusion you must remember has come into play only in the year 2018 otherwise earlier the charity commissioner was empowered to take action against such people also but now only so as to uh, rather empower the trust more to take appropriate action against such trespassers or those who adverse possession of the property of the trust and in addition to that if there is the charity commissioner is of the opinion that the administration of any uh, it is necessary for the administration of the trust to obtain a particular direction from the court or for that matter it is necessary to seek an injunction or declaration in favor or against of the against the trust or the trustees of the trust then the charity commissioner please remember charity commissioner himself after making requisite inquiry as he thinks necessary can file a suit and also at the same time if 
there are two or more persons having interest in the trust and they think that there is a necessary to take a direction from the court for better administration of the public trust and one or more persons think that there is a necessity for seeking declaration or injunction against or in favor of the trust after obtaining the requisite consent from the trust uh, consent from the charity commissioner can approach the uh, civil court with by filing a suit now the nature of the prayers are also included in section 50 the prayers that he can see inter area include the prayer of removal of any trustee or manager but more than that as i mentioned to you for recovery of the trust property which is already left the or has already denounced the character of the public trust for recovery of such property you can approach the civil court under section 50 that civil court also has the power for appointment of a new trustee or manager under section 50 and in the sense that the suit can also be filed but only upon obtaining of the permission of the charity commissioner then you can file a suit for direction for taking accounts and making certain inquiries and order directing the trustees or others to pay to the trust the loss caused to the same by their breach of trust negligence misapplication conduct or willful deed now naturally these are the powers to an extent at the same time for recovery of the public trust property the charity commissioner is empowered even the mortgage property it can be recovered uh, the charity commissioner can do redemption actually even the property that's been wrongfully sold the charity commissioner can initiate the suit proceedings by filing a suit under section 50 and even for winding up of any trust by applying the first funds for any other charitable trust getting or handing over of one trust to the trustees of some other trust and deregistering such trust even for an order exonerating the trustees from any technical breaches an order varying altering amending or super seeding any instrument of trust a suit can be that there is misapplication on the part of the trustees but as i told you certain powers are overlapping so many a times or other maximum times generally the powers under section 50 are invoked only when there is a need to recover the property of the trust or generally i'm not saying this is the only use of section 50 but majority of times the section 50 is invoked for the purpose of revo recovering the property of the trust or seeking accounts because the charity commissioner cannot function as a civil court so as to grant such claims <coughs> now under the powers of the charity commissioner there is one more power which in that sense very important or rather very cardinal or rather very uh, substantial one which is the power to modify the scheme for example if there is a scheme of a trust that scheme of a trust the property but not construction property by whatever available means and now in the given circumstances because sometimes trust were created created 100 years ago 200 years ago and in such situation sometimes author don't foresee the eventuality that may arise after 200 years so under such circumstances there may be a need that can be felt by the trustees to amend the scheme of the trust and obtain appropriate amendment in the organization of the trust so as to ensure or so as to get the powers to use the trust funds of the trust for development of the proper development of its lands or for other purposes as they may think deem fit or they may think necessary the charity commission under 50a can amend the scheme naturally upon hearing the parties or upon assistant charity commissioner or deputy charity commissioner's report and even the assistant charity commissioner or deputy charity commissioner if they also have a reason to believe that it will be it, it will be in the interest of the proper management and administration of the public trust a scheme should be settled for it settled for or <clears throat> there is a need to amend the scheme then you can apply under section 50a or this scheme can be amended under section 50a but naturally such amendment such modification such amalgamation of the uh, uh, schemes of the two trusts cannot take place unless there is an opportunity of uh, or there is a the principles of natural justice are heard by the charity commissioner by the assistant or deputy charity commissioner that uh, after that uh, really speaking the only couple of sections are remaining and one more section that i need to highlight upon is the 
principle of Cyprus. Now, what does principle of Cyprus mean? It means that when the property of the trust or when the assistant, especially when the assistant or deputy charity commissioner is of the opinion that the object for which the public trust was created has failed, so any public trust has not been utilized or is not like it, or in the case of the public trust other than the trust for really interest, expedient, practicable, desirable, or necessary or proper to carry out fully or partly the original intention of the offer of the public trust or the object of the public trust, then the property or the income of such public trust or any portion thereof can be applied for other charitable or religious objects. So basically, if one trust in that sense is either trustees or other the charity or assistant or deputy charity commission is of the opinion that the trust funds or the properties of a particular trust can be utilized for exercising or executing the objects for which it was created or it has now become impossible or the objects have now failed, then the properties or objects of that particular trust can be utilized towards the religious or charitable objects of other nature which are not included in the instrument of the trust, which are not included in the instrument that gave birth to the particular trust. Therefore, that also according to me is one of the important aspects or rather in aspect of the power that are vested with the powers that are vested with the charity commission. Apart from that, uh, Overall general powers are mentioned in section 68 and 69, but these powers are nothing but the powers that I have explained to you in the sections that I have already uh, covered in my lecture. So I don't have to repeat those sections. So overall, really speaking, these are the powers, these are the obligations of the charity commissioner, assistant charity commissioner, as well as the deputy charity commissioner. This is how the charity commissioner is supposed to function. This is how the charity commissioner or the assistant charity commissioner, the deputy charity commissioner must exercise his obligation, take his decision in accordance with the law as I have just highlighted to you to various sections. Now, sometimes it happens that various proceedings are filed and these proceedings are run or rather these proceedings are filed using the funds of the trust. These proceedings are such that have taken birth out of the fighting between two warring groups of these are the really speaking outcome of the ego of the trustees and trust me these litigations are humongous in terms of numbers. So the charity commissioner also has the power to award costs to a particular trust or rather to decide as to from whose pocket or from whose funds such the cost of the particular litigation will be paid. Therefore to ensure that the monies of the public trust are not needlessly spent on this litigation, either useful or useless. That's the best where the decision best left for the adjudication of the commissioner comes to the conclusion that any particular litigation is frivolous or vexatious, even then it can award compensation to the party involved or the party support. So, really speaking, <clears throat> these are overall powers and obligations of the charity commissioner, and this is how the the litigation before the charity commissioner, charity commissioner uh, is covered. These are the sections within which the litigation before the charity commissioner is covered. We have a few questions from the participants. If you have to form a trust for, say, stray animal welfare, do you have to register it with the charity commissioner in Mumbai? Yes. Can a new trustee act as a trustee upon filing an application or is a specific approval required from the charity commissioner? So, well, that depends, Petra, as well as how is what is the procedure to be followed for appointing a new trustee. As I mentioned during the lecture, if the trustee resigns and a new trustee is appointed in accordance with the procedure laid down in the instrument of trust, then you don't have to wait for the outcome of the change report. The new trustee can very well go ahead and take the <clears throat> business in its own hands and start functioning. And therefore, uh, the, to, to give you the answer, Yes, the new trustee need not wait for the outcome of the change report. He can immediately take over the functions of the retiring trustee and function. But okay. sometimes this complication give rise to various disputes between the outgoing and incoming trustee because sometimes the outgoing trustee, after having realized that he has made a mistake by tendering his resignation, is not willing to hand over his job or hand over his uh, post or office to the incoming trustee. And that also then gives rise, gives rise to, uh, you know, uh, unending litigation, I must say. 
but yes to answer the question is new, uh, new trustee upon appointment can immediately take up the job it is also important to understand how the new trustee is appointed as i mentioned to you instrument of trust sometimes gives a procedure for appointment of a trustee and if you follow that procedure new trustee can immediately take over but if the new trustee is appointed under section 47 of the public trust act where the charity commission has the power to appoint a trustee then naturally unless the order is passed of appointment uh, that new trustee cannot function the next question was how can a public charitable trust be wound up if the trustees do not want to continue it look the public charitable trust really speaking is in, is, is 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 permanent in nature the trustees can't decide whether to continue or not if the trustees are not willing to continue they can resign and in their place new trustees can appoint appoint but really speaking the charity community charitable trust or a public trust will continue to function unless its objectives are fulfilled or um, unless it is impossible to perform its objective perform its uh, you know purpose only in such situation as i mentioned the revocation can take place under 193a or uh, uh, under 50 so there is no such provision where the trustees will actually come together and decide okay we don't want this trust to exist and therefore let's just wind it up it's not like a company where the voluntarily voluntary winding up is permissible or used to be permissible uh, the next question is can the funds of a public charitable trust be distributed without re re-registering the trust as per the new rules in 2020 if look if 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 there is a particular class that is mentioned and only for that particular class or particular people the funds are to be given or utilized then i don't think that is a public charitable trust at first place now if there is let's say public at large or a particular section of public or society for whose benefit that public trust is going to function then in such situation you can very well utilize that's a duty of the trustees to utilize the funds to execute its purpose to act in accordance with the object of the trust so if they act they don't have any embargo on that if they are acting in the uh, instrument of trust they are not acting against anything they are acting in accordance with the law so the yes the answer is yes, you can distribute but distribute is the word that generally utilized in the in connection with the private trust and not the not the public trust uh, the next question is uh, can a public trust registered in mumbai district be transferred to a new address in say raigad district yes yes someone has started a trust which objectives were as a medical aid trust hmm. uh, now that they have completed their law degree they would like to change the objectives of the trust to being a medical and a legal aid trust Uh, can you amend the name of constitution of a trust to make it to change the objectives of yes, the trust yes 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 you can can a trustee be amended to increase or decrease the number of trustees or change the objects yes yes so after obtaining the permission and one more aspect i forgot to in that sense uh, cover in the lecture is as far as the mumbai is concerned there are various public trusts that have taken birth out of the instrument of uh, testamentary dispositions or testamentary instruments now for interpretation or rather for amending or or rather for expanding the objects of such trust there is a separate provision that can be utilized or that can be taken help of which is the procedure envisaged under rule 238 of the bombay high court rules where you can very well apply to the bombay high court by filing an originating summons and seek the court's decision court's help court's opinion on a question that may have arisen you can seek interpretation of a particular clause arising or mentioned in the deed you can also frame certain additional rules that may be or required to be framed for the effective functioning or for the effective uh, implementation of the disposition can a trust registered in mumbai purchase a property in another state for conducting its activities yeah but naturally it will be in accordance with section 36 when and how does the property become public trust property can a property be bought uh, brought into the public trust before the trust is registered in the name of the trust you can certainly purchase but when you file an application for registration you will have to disclose such purchase and actually upon registration the transaction that you have undertaken will come within the supervision of the charity commissioner so if charity commissioner thinks that you have purchased this property at a overpriced rate you can very well conduct an inquiry the last question is how can a how can change report disputes be solved in a prescribed time period 
as generally years and years pass by to decide who the real trustees are in a particular trust so what suggestion would you have so to resolve the disputes in within the prescribed time period really speaking time bound disposal there is no such uh, uh, suggestion or really other way of looking at it would be by appointing an arbitrator but unfortunately the arbitra- arbit- arbitrator can't be appointed for resolving the disputes and because of sheer amount of proceedings that every assistant or deputy charity commissioner has to deal with on any given day this change reports disposal is delayed so any mediator or arbitrator can be appointed because many of the times it happens is just ego fight that has resulted into the change report so if an effective mediator takes over and suggest some plausible practical solutions then certainly the disputes can come to an end thank you